So I'm happy to um, tell you that we have two groups of people presenting two different projects. Um, we have uh, Benny Sluchin and uh, Mikhail Malt, um, both presenting on um, Cage's music for underscore, music for N, and a group from Toronto uh, presenting on the um, on Cage's cartridge music. And this is Brian Lutek, um, Tim Roth, uh, Tyler Cunningham, and Gordon Fry. So um, thank you all for being here. This is really nice. Uh, the idea, I think, is that we're going to give uh, each of these two projects about 30 minutes and uh, try to leave a moment or two for people to ask some you know, questions specifically about that project. And then uh, we have 30 minutes at the end for some open discussion. Um, and I can I can throw some questions in to kind of prompt uh, discussion in a particular way. But I'm hoping that the people here that are, are listening and participating will um, will have some questions and thoughts. I think these two projects are really interesting. They're both very different works by Cage. And you're, I think both of your projects um, with respect to the works by Cage are very, very different, but there are some nice similarities. And I hope that we can tease that out and have some interesting discussion about what it means to realize um, these, these fairly radical works of John Cage in the, in the you know, approaching the mid 21st century. Um, so I didn't ask uh, all of you who wants to go first. Um, I will tell you that I read the papers both times in the order um, of, Malt and Sluchin first, and uh, the, the quartet second. So um, I would propose, I don't think it matters either way, but if that's okay for you, then that seems as reasonable as anything. Great, awesome. So I'll leave it to, to both of you then. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, the work we propose to talk about is Music for by John Cage. Originally, I wanted to do a, a work with local musicians and to put the piece together with our work. Unfortunately, this was impossible last year and this is still impossible. So to start with, I looked back at the one, uh, I would say, normal execution of the piece. Uh, here we are. No, it's a, in September 2015, I curated a special concert at the Villa Savoie, conceived by Le Corbusier in the 1920s, situated near Paris, the villa is a museum combining particular architecture and acoustics. I wanted the public to discover the place, but I had no stage and no large room where the audience could be seated. Music from the 20th century was chosen partly from the same period the villa came into being. Also, the number of musicians involved was limited for this event. John Cage's Music 4 was a perfect composition for the occasion. Instrumentation could be chosen within the existing part, so we performed music for four with viola, flute, trumpet, and trombone. Musicians are free in space and time, as there is no ensemble score, and the performers are independent. Their placement was selected in different parts of the villa, as no visual connection is necessary. The stopwatches are used to execute separate parts according to time brackets, temporal parentheses that give the performers margin according to which they start and stop the sound events as they wish. An initial time bracket permits each performer to reach his placement. <laughs>
the interpreter who approaches the music of John Cage, composed after the middle of the 20th century, is often disconcerned by a great deal of freedom of the execution associated with a set of precise instructions. The result is that each time the musician is led, led to determine a version and to decide a choice on a choice among the three elements proposed by the piece. A fixed score is thus created, which can be used several times. The musician interprets his version while thinking that it conforms to the composer's intention. But in fact, most works of Cage should not be preconceived, prepared, pre-generated for several executions. Each interpretation should be unique and undetermined. It is this sense, in this sense, that the use of the computer can help the performer. A program will allow the latter to discover without being able to anticipate what and when he plays. The performance of, performance of the work thus escapes the intention of the musician to organize the material text. In previous work, we modeled time brackets by parallelograms to build computer interfaces for interpretation assistance in the context of Cage 2.5, a piece for trombone and piano. The first step in the process was to model a graphic representation of each part as a succession of musical events in time, where we have a starting time zone and an ending time zone. As the two intervals have, in our case, a designed superposition, we prefer to distinguish starting using two parallel lines. Over time, we realized that the shape used to represent time brackets brought important information for the interpretation and musical analysis. The unusual long duration of this piece, 40 minutes, and the use of time brackets shows that the temporal question and its representation is essential in the number pieces. To obtain a graphic representation of each event in time, we consider the quadruple SLDK, SUDK, ELDK, EUDK, where SLDK, SUDK is the starting time zone and ELDK, EUDK, the ending time zone. The graphic event obtained by connecting the four points as a quadrilateral shape. The eight has no particular meaning. The starting duration delta S decay is defined as the difference S U decay minus S L decay, which is the time span the performer has to start an event. In the same way, the ending duration delta E decay will be the time span given to end the event E U decay minus E L decay. When dealing with cage number pieces, one generally has the starting time duration equals to the ending time duration, delta K. Both durations are the same, and the figure to represent is a trapezoid. We call the duration delta K the cage duration of the event. This is the case in the majority of the corpus we are dealing with. There is mostly an overlapping of the two time zones, SLDK, SUDK, and ELDK, EUDK, but it can happen that those are disjoined. We can define a variable 
gamma k, where is S and K equals gamma k equal E and K. In K geometries, gamma k depends generally on the event duration. Thus, we don't have a huge variety of forms. An alternative way to represent a quadruple will be S of the K, delta S the K, delta E the K, and gamma K, where gamma K is the value previously discussed. This representation can easily display the regularity in the time bracket construction. Concerning the placement of the two contiguous events, K and K plus one, we can define a variable epsilon the K, the gap between the elements K and K plus one, where epsilon the K is SL the K plus one minus EU the K, the geometric representation described here has been proved useful in the case of John Cage number pieces. A global view of the piece is available and the time management while performing is improved. In these pieces, the time brackets are filled with only few musical elements. In the majority of case, cases, only one note. Thank you. Uh, okay, let's see now uh, about music four. Uh, between 90, uh, 1984 and 1987, John Cage composed a family of works called music four. The principle of this composition is the same. Musical events are spaced over a total duration of 30 minutes using time brackets. There are 17 individual parts, flute, oboe, clarinet, trumpet, horn, trombone, two violins, viola, cello, four percussions, two pianos, and voice, which can be performed individually or together in any combination. The number of performers involved in them compl completes the title. Thus, music for two will be the title for any combination of two instruments from the parts. The principle of this construction is the same as a uh, concert for piano and orchestra, an early work of Cage, uh, 1957-1958. Versions of shorter durations also can be made. The variety of combination than, uh, than music for can be created. It shows that we are dealing in fact with a family of works, not only does the choice of the instruments permit a larger number of realizations, but also each part individually gives the performer a lot of interpretative choices. In music four, one finds two types of time brackets, the usual flexible ones that have variable times which the performer, uh, with, which, within which the performer begins and ends playing that he calls he with stage, the pieces, and the fixed time brackets that has specific start and stop times that Cage called interludes. Music four is comprised of three kinds of music, two of which happen in the pieces, uh, repeated quiet sustained tones separ separated by rests, and a dense and specially proportionally notated music characterized by a wide range of quickly shifting dynamic levels, referred as to A and B music respectively. The third material, it's one that fills the interludes, a shunt-like notation free of, rhythm, free of rhythmic specificity, referred as C. Uh, regardless the duration choice within time brackets, it's clear that a fourth category of music present must be silence, represented as a classical rest music notation in material A and as proportional empty space. In the parts of music four, the, flex the flexible time brackets falls into four types according with duration. Observing carefully the time brackets used in music four show that the the cage duration are 30, 45, 60, and 75 seconds, while the overlapping time zone, the gamma k, 
it's a constant of the cache duration minus 15 seconds. The 17 parts of MUSIC4 share several characteristics. The parts use two types of time brackets, flexible for the pieces and fixed for the interludes. The total number of time brackets vary from part to part, as well as the type. This design is easily detected from our timeline representation that we are going to, to show to present to you. The duration of the fixed time brackets vary, vary between 5, 10, or 15 seconds. The following table displays the data of, of each of the parts. As specified in the instruction for players, the parts are then to be played as taught from different points in space. The players may sit anywhere within the auditorium with respect to the audience and to each other. For this, for this purpose, an initial time bracket is noted at the beginning of each part, allowing each performer to determine his own starting time within this time bracket. This personal duration permits the performance to get to their placement in the hall. In this way, any relationship between the event placements is dependent on this initial shift. The time left at the end of the part after the last event will complete the total duration of 30 minutes. For example, in the flute part, the last event, an interlude, has as time 28 minutes 50 seconds as ending time. That gives a remaining time of 1 minute 10 seconds which will constitute the initial time bracket. In analog way to our previous work, we propose to generate the timeline of each individual part with geometric figures, parallelogram for regular time brackets and straight lines for the fixed ones. In this case, the different materials will be coded by color, yellow for the A material, long-held notes eventually repeated, green for the virtuosistic 1B, and the slanted violet lines for the C material of the interviews. The graphic proportion of the first two materials are respected in the sharing of the figure. Thus, before approaching the element 12 of the trombone part, the musician is aware of the fact that it's composed of only long notes, is the yellow one, and, start, and the starting point can be chosen later than that of the left time bracket. On the contrary, in element four, with a cage duration of 30 seconds, contain approximately a half of virtuosistic material, and choosing the starting point early situated will enable an ending in a less panic way. As with earlier interfaces we proposed, this timeline presentation helps time management. One concludes that in music four parts, the fourth element silence, you have smaller rate in comparison to the average number of pieces. For this reason, we represented a parameter, a density factor for the green material B. This is a positive number, given the ratio of the number of notes to be performed to the proportional time of that figure. For example, in element five shown here, we will have 10 notes associated with a relatively large proportion of the green material, more or less 86%. The cage duration of these elements is six seconds, so we obtain a density of 0 0.19. In all the parts of music four, except for the vocal part, the pieces are written on two systems. For this reason, it's hard when playing to estimate the time given and the ease to perform. In analog way for the interludes, we calculate the ratio between the numbers of notes to duration for the element. Five, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. 
Uh, in analog way for the interludes, we calculate the ratio between the number of notes to the duration of the element, 5, 10, or 15 seconds. For example, for element 21 of trombone part, we get the small value of 0 0.2. There is just one note for five seconds. This is not the smallest one can encounter, as we get 0 0.06 for element 36, one note for, one note for uh, 15 seconds, and zero for the element 37. A higher value occurs when we have a short interlude containing many notes, as in event three. Here, the density factor is 1.6. These factors are incorporated in the data we compile for each part. This is with musicological purpose, a table in which the temporal data is given in seconds, in which the, five, the first five columns we display the time bracket data in an equivalent way, the SLK, Delta SK, Delta EK, Gamma K, and Epsilon K with both cage durations, which are almost exclusively equal. The last three columns, T1 and T2, displays the materials A, B, and C that composes each event. And the last column, displays the corresponding density parameter, rho key. By its nature, for example, the material A, one held repeated tone, does not display any density parameter useful for, per for performance. Just uh, two words here, uh, just to explain that the important here is to uh, generate, to conceive um, a representation for the performance, but also to try to have the material data for uh, musicological uh, purpose. In the case of music four, this formal form permits the detection of anomalies. For example, when we perform the events 25, 26, and 27 in the viola part, you can mention that element 26 has an abnormal a time bracket parameter. Its form is inversion and it does not fit in the sequence. Playing the part from the original, original presentation and the display of time bracket as numerical data on the timeline does not permit to grasp particularities easily and especially when overlap occurs. As another example, one has the violin one part where different impossibilities occur. For example, event six overlaps with event five and event eight with event seven. Here, a solution should be found before the performance. One could simply, simply omit event six and seven or to generate more elaborate solutions. Um, about the density factor now. The density factor is rated, is rated graphically displayed. The digital information is hardly perceived during the performance. The eye grasps a tendency without having to get the right number involved. It's why, as a matter of fact, for the moment, we display the density factor for B and C material as a saturation parameter for the filling color. This is a display option for the musician. There are different ways to take advantage of this knowledge and to anticipate the handling of a musical event while performing. In compound pieces, AB or BA type, one could use the information on density in order to anticipate, man manage the time and resources for the performance. The density represented as a saturation parameter enhances the preparation of the part. Here is an example of the density representation in the case of the C material. Um, what we, I, we would like to, to propose now is just a kind of mock-up that, that was based in our early work for, the, for this new interface that we are preparing. Here uh, in this mock-up, this is not the original um, software that is, uh, is 
it's a work in progress. You can find the timeline of the first eight minutes, a chronometer, very important. The time cursor that you give to the performer, um, the information where uh, here are, and the musical events to be performed at the time. This is just two, uh, two examples. This one where we are at one minute, and, and the other minute, uh, other example where we are at five minutes and 30 seconds. The idea is uh, at each time, then the cursor passes by one of the one of these uh, trapezoids. Uh, we have a sliding uh, event that appears in the window below. Okay. At the present time, we work to offer the musician a way to approach other pieces from the same family, constructing a generic interface. The work called number pieces share the same principle described earlier, but often contain particularities and exceptions in the instruction for performance. The interface then has to be adapted to cover this. The interface will be a substitute to the printed score. It will reveal the structure of the work and provides the performer with a tool to achieve the meditative concentration needed. The few instructions given by Cage are integrated in the interface. Considering the graphic representation we presented, our main goal was to find geometric properties and strategies to enhance the performance of this piece through computer interface and adapted representation. Thank you. Thank you both. That was that was really really interesting. Um, really nice. Yeah, I. Uh, it's a nice interface, and the, it's it seems very simple and easy to 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 learn to read and non obtrusive. I think looking looking at the the these you know geometrical figures along with the um, the notation. Um, well, uh, let me just ask if there are any questions that they would anybody would like to ask about. Um, uh, this this presentation. Rama. Uh, I just had a very quick question about the um, calculating the density. Um, I wasn't quite quite clear um, because it looked like you were uh, I, there's no is there a duration specification for I think it's type C. Uh, uh, I, I wasn't sure how you were getting the percentage because the I wasn't. It's unclear to me that it would be a short or long note, even if it's written as a solid note head. If it's in a, if it's in a, uh, I mean, you can calculate the empty space around the note, but if there's there's no durational information as well. So, uh, but maybe it's in the score. I'm not. I'm not sure. Or or maybe I, I don't. Uh, I'm not as familiar with the practice. Uh, performance practice of the piece but um uh is that is that something um, it's uh, a kind of uh, a thing that is up to the performer normally there is an articulation sometimes staccato sometimes more sustained note but uh, according to the, the, the duration of the event, you adapt in, uh, at the length of the note and you try to not to introduce space between the notes. But uh, as far as Cage is concerned, he, he just gives a, a very vague way to approach the interlude. Hmm. I could Just imagine to complete um, yes. the imagine. question. Yes, to complete the the yes. how it's calculated. Uh, it's really you remember each one of the two parts. Uh, just very quickly, uh, each one of the the two parts. Uh, we, we have a kind of of duration, okay? And uh, in fact, you take this duration and really measuring with the rule. You calculate, uh, you, you calculate a kind of parts. It's uh, just to 
to, to share again with you. Sorry, where I am. Okay. For example, here in this part, you see, uh, you see that you have a begin and an end, and you can estimate a duration of this part. And after what you do, and what Benny that did it uh, was a lot of work for each one of the events uh, to calculate calculate the graphic proportion in a given duration. The, and this is what how was uh, done. The idea for the density uh, is not to be really precise, but to give a kind of clue, a kind of indication for the uh, for the performer uh, how it's what is the weather that it's coming. You know, it's just to give an idea. Oh, now I'm, I must manage. If I have one one held note at the beginning, oh, I am cool. I can make this held note shorter and give more time to more complex material and so on. Right. This was an aspect of your paper that I recalled, which was um, that, you know, there, there's a there's the kind of intention of, on Cage's part that these performers play with a kind of concentrated meditative quality. But it's difficult if you find yourself in a situation where you've set yourself up because you didn't you didn't give yourself enough time to deal with the material that's coming. You get yourself into a panic or, or whatever. Um, I see Todd has his hand up. Hi, thank you. Uh, I don't have a question. I, I simply wanted to say thank you very much and that I uh, enjoyed uh, an earlier paper where um, uh, you also have the seventh tone tuner for trombone. And uh, because Cage's last works were microtonal 14th tones or seventh tones. And uh, uh, so it's a real pleasure to meet you virtually and hear your presentation on uh, on this topic, which I've been uh, interested in for years. So thank you, that's all. Thank you. Any other questions? Or is the second group, are you, are you all ready to go? Yep, I think so. Great, yeah, sounds good. Can everyone see that? Great. John Cage's cartridge music, written and premiered in 1960, represents a pivotal shift not only in Cage's personal explorations in electronic music, but also in the world of electronic music performance as a whole. By further developing his ideas about indeterminate scores and performance, Cage creates a novel kind of theatrical aesthetic for the live performance of electronic music in a world where electronic music consisted almost entirely of works recorded to tape. Cage describes the setup in the scores instruction page. The piece is to be performed with ordinary phonograph pickups in which customarily a playing needle is inserted, but instead of a playing needle, any object that will fit into a cartridge may be inserted, for example a coil of wire, a toothpick, a pipe cleaner, a twig, etc. The score also calls for a number of indeterminate auxiliary sounds produced by using piezo pickups. Cage suggests that it is convenient for the production of auxiliary sounds to place contact microphones on the objects microphone stand, table, etc., to which the cartridges are attached. If this is done, many auxiliary sounds of an electronic character are easily produced. These cartridges and contact microphones are then connected to amplifiers with tone and volume control. In contrast to Cage's previous use of chance operations, where pre-compositional random procedures were used to determine a fixed score, the indeterminacy espoused in cartridge music instead invites the performer into the compositional process by having each player produce their own score, making the preparation process feel almost like playing a board game. The first step in playing this game, or creating the score, is to decide the number of cartridges and the length of the piece. Cage instructs that the number of players must be at least equal to, but no more than twice the number of cartridges. For our performance, since we knew that there would be four performers, we decided through much deliberation that four cartridges would suffice. We also decided that we wanted the performance to be about eight minutes in length, which is also the length that Cage suggests. After deciding the number of players and cartridges, the group must select what will be essentially the board of the game from which each performer's part will be created. As part of the materials of the piece, Cage provides 20 sheets each with a number of squiggly biomorphic shapes ranging from 1 to 20. 
These shapes correspond to the number of cartridges in the performance, so our group selected the sheet with four shapes. In addition to the shapes, four transparency sheets are also needed to create the score. One with black dots, one with open circles, one with a dotted line, and one with a stopwatch face. These transparency sheets are laid on top of the biomorphic shapes, and the player must interpret this arrangement in order to understand what to play. Each arrangement of the transparencies corresponds to one minute of music, so each player must rearrange and interpret the transparencies for each minute of the performance. The dotted line transparency represents the line the performer will follow, and the way the line intersects with the shapes and other transparencies will determine what the performer will play during this minute of music and when. The dotted line has an open circle at one end representing the start of the line, which must be placed over one of the dots on the transparency sheet with black dots. The dots represent actual sound events. So if the dotted line intersects with a black dot that falls inside one of the shapes, then a sound is made on the corresponding cartridge. If it intersects with a black dot that falls outside of the shapes, then a sound is made on any of the piezo contact microphones. The transparency sheet with the open circles corresponds to changes in tone and volume controls for the cartridge amplifiers. If the dotted line intersects with a circle inside one of the shapes, then the volume of the corresponding cartridge is adjusted. This adjustment is made by how the dotted line intersects with the circle, as if you're reading the circle like a clock face. If the intersection is tangential, then you just take one reading and adjust the knob to that position. So for example, if it touches a circle tangentially at about 3 o'clock, then you adjust the volume knob to 3 o'clock. But if the dotted line crosses through the middle of the circle with an entry and exit point, then you take the reading of both points and Cage instructs that either may be used in the performance. If the dotted line crosses a circle that is outside of the shapes, then the tone knob of the cartridge corresponding to the shape closest to the circle is adjusted in the same manner. If any of the dots or circles intersect with the dotted line in a place where the line loops over itself, then that action is repeated as a loop at any speed for any amount of time. The transparency with a stopwatch face is placed over the dotted line so that the line intersects it in some way. The intersection of the dotted line with the watch face is generally regarded as a rest during that time period meaning that the events that occur before the dotted line intersects with the watch happen before that time marking, and the subsequent events happening after the time marking at which the dotted line leaves the watch face. The dotted line may intersect with the watch multiple times depending on how the sheets are arranged. This process is repeated for each minute of the piece by rearranging the transparencies, and as a result, each, each player comes up with a shorthand script of their own performance where they have written down their actions and the time windows they occur in for each minute of the performance. Initially, it seems that John Cage wanted a pretty dense realization of the piece, expressing in a letter to David Tudor from June 1960 that his desire was to use up to two dozen cartridges. That never quite materialized, although a performance from October of 1960 included eight other players, which is still quite a bit considering the technology at the time. For Cage, the use of live performers in cartridge music constitutes a shift in viewpoint towards electronic music. Up until this point, the output for electronic music involved splicing tape or recording synthesizers to play over loudspeakers. Notable composers of electronic music from this era, such as Karl Heinz Stockhausen and Edgar Varese, were primarily concerned with the total rhythmic and timbral organization of sound that the medium had to offer. Instead, Cartridge music demonstrates Cage's interest in the use of electronic music as a method to enhance theatricality. In their liner notes for his 1962 cartridge music recording, Cage said, These objectives were uppermost in my mind when I supplied the material for cartridge music. First, to bring about a situation in which any determination made by a performer would not necessarily be realizable. When, for instance, one of the performers changes a volume control, lowering it to nearly zero, the other performer's action, if it is affected by that particular amplification system, is inaudible. I had been concerned with composition, which was indeterminate of its performance, but in this instance, performance is made, so to say, 
indeterminate of itself. Second, to make electronic music live. There are many ways to do this. The one I here chose was to make a theatrical situation involving amplifiers and loudspeakers and live musicians. This theatrical situation recontextualizes the necessary components of electronic music as the catalyst for further theatrical exploration on stage. John Cage's interest in theater came at a moment when the theatrical tradition itself was unwinding. It was a moment represented by our toes turn away from classical modes of theater making for a theatricality that, as Jane Goodall writes, traverses and restores existence and flesh in each of their aspects. Cage was particularly drawn to the work of Artaud, whose theater of cruelty pursued an origin, or in other words, a theater without hierarchy, without text, directors, and actors in the conventional sense. Cage is explicit about his interest in Artaud. M.C. Richards had translated the theater in its double of Artaud, and we got the idea from Artaud that theater could take place free of a text, that if a text were in it, that it needn't determine the other actions, that sounds, that activities, and so forth, could all be free rather than tied together. By detangling texts from theater, Cage finds a relationship between theater and everyday life. How this relationship manifests in his theater pieces is hinted in an interview between Cage, Schechner, and Kirby. Cage saying, you know what the word theatrical should mean? Schechner replying, convincingly, either they should have done it well or not at all. Cage finally saying, I couldn't be in greater agreement. If there are intentions, then there should be every effort made to realize those intentions. Otherwise, carelessness takes over. However, if one is able to act in a way that doesn't have intention in it, then there is no need for rehearsal. Convincingly becomes synonymous with theatricality, which depends on a lack of, or fullness of, intention. Theatricality for Cage then becomes a substitute for everyday life, and Cage frames everyday life either as a total absence or fullness of intention. Cage's definition of theater is quite expansive then. Simply, theater is something which engages both the eye and the ear. A definition so simple as to allow everyday life itself as theater. So John Cage's theater, on the one hand, necessitates the interaction between the auditory and visual senses, while on the other hand, requires a complete lack of, or less frequently, a fullness of, intention what we know as John Cage's indeterminacy. What could be more theatrical than the silent pieces? Somebody comes on the stage and does absolutely nothing. As we will elaborate, Cage's cartridge music launches off from his two-part definition of theater, that is, of the audiovisual interaction and indeterminacy, locating a moment where the emerging innovations of the electronic music world meet that of postmodernist theater. One aspect of cartridge music that interested both us and Cage is the disconnect between the visual source and the audible sound present in the work. This sound source disconnect has been described in various contexts. Um, it can first be described as a real-time version of schizophonia, a term coined by composer R. Murray Schaefer to describe the effect of a recorded sound that has been separated from its original source. Michel Chion's notion of synchresis describes a similar effect in film, described by the scholar as the spontaneous and irresistible weld produced between a particular auditory phenomenon and a visual phenomenon when they occur at the same time. Whereas synchresis refers to the relationship between audio and video in film, and schizophonia refers to the nature of recorded sound, the sound source disconnect in cartridge music is distinct in that it occurs during a live performance. To the audience's perspective, the performer's gestures are clearly making the resulting sounds. However, the sonic result of activating these tiny objects such as springs and, and rocks is wildly different than expected. In cartridge music, the earliest attempt at making electronic music live, this sound source disconnect is due to the nature of this piece to spatialize and amplify sound. Amplification in the piece served to defamiliarize the sound from widely considered commonplace sounds, 
And while Cage is not an innovator in this regard, the liveness of Cartridge music amplifies this disconnect between the visual object and the unfamiliar, monstrous sound that it emits. Additionally, even when it is not necessarily desired, electronic music that is amplified will always be spatialized too, a disconnect that, however minuscule, is nonetheless present, since the emitting amplified sound comes from the speaker and not from the source. For Cage, this theatrical situation that occurs from the logistics of live electronic music, that is, the disconnect from the body on stage and the materials against the resulting amplification and spatialization, is a battle of the visual and auditory, what Michel Chion might call audiovisual dissonance. The idea of the sound source disconnect is also present in Cage's description of the musical moment mentioned in the earlier quote, when one of the performers changes a volume control, lowering it to nearly zero, the other performer's action, if it is affected by that particular amplification system, is inaudible. Cage showed a clear interest in this feature of cartridge music. Along with the liner notes, he can be found describing this exact musical moment on four separate occasions, found in Richard Costellanis' 2003 book Conversing with Cage, which is an amalgamation of over 150 interviews that Cage gave throughout his life. Understanding the theatrical nature of the sound source disconnect in cartridge music helps to inform performances of the work. One of the best ways to do this is to set up the source so that the performer's actions are as visually clear to the audience as possible. This can be achieved by selecting items with unique and clear gestures to amplify, or by finding objects that can be suspended in some way. When creating the score, a performer may initially feel discouraged about a musical moment where another player turns down the volume of their pickup, essentially muting their action. However, knowledge of the composer's interest in such moments allows for performers to embrace these moments when, as Cage put it, the performance is indeterminate of itself. Now I'll talk a little bit about preparing the piece and how we applied these interests to our interpretation. In the process of preparing the piece, our first step was to find and assemble these phono cartridges and piezo pickups. What we ended up with, you can see here, are these pretty rudimentary little assemblies. Each type of pickup is wired to a quarter inch jack and then the whole mess is mounted on a small piece of thin plywood. Once we had those, we began experimenting with what sorts of sounds we could produce with these things. That was a really fun afternoon for us, because once you have this stuff in your hands, the beauty of the piece really springs to life. If any of you have had the opportunity to play with contact mics, then I'm sure you'll understand how endless the variety of sounds that you can make with them is, and that even the tiniest sound, which would otherwise be impossible to bring out in a live performance, all of a sudden speaks easily and clearly. It became obvious to us in this experimentation that we wanted to be able to keep as much of that diversity of sound as possible. We also realized that when in our performance scripts we had to change the material inserted into one of the cartridges, that was a big logistical problem. It took too long and it made a ton of noise, and so it would be next to impossible to stay on schedule with the rest of the actions we needed to execute within that time bracket. These two things together prompted us to decide that instead of attaching the materials to the phono cartridges and attaching the piezo pickups to whatever structure the cartridges were mounted on, as Cage suggests in the score, that we'd be more successful leaving both freely hung by their cords so we could take them and apply them to whatever object as the need arose. In order to remain faithful to the score, we assigned each cartridge to a single object, except for where our realization of the score calls for a change of that material. But the handheld piezos also allowed us to be creative about the ways in which we made our auxiliary sounds. Some examples of this are sticking the end of a roll of tape to the element and unrolling it, or dragging the edge of a piezo disc directly along the length of a bow. We were faithful to the score in keeping the signal from each cartridge in its own separate channel and loudspeaker following Cage's suggestion that the loudspeakers are to be distributed around the audience. So each of our four cartridges was played through one of four loudspeakers, which were arranged in the four corners of the hall. We also spatialized the piezo pickups with the cartridges, so that player one's auxiliary sounds were played through cartridge one's speaker, player two's auxiliary sounds with cartridge two, and etc. 
In order to apply the volume and tone controls, we used a patch in Peer Data, which is a visual programming language. The tone and volume controls in the patch are mapped to eight knobs on a small MIDI controller, which we placed in the center of the ensemble, where it's easily accessible. One interesting detail of this part of the setup was deciding what to use for the tone control. In one of Cage's letters, he gives a list of tech requirements for the piece, and it doesn't include a separate piece of equipment to do the filtering, but it does include a number of guitar amps, which would have been his loudspeakers. I don't know if this is representative of his performances or just arose out of convenience, but in this case anyway, it seems like they would have used whatever EQ those guitar amps had. So in our patch, we decided to use a bandpass filter, which allows frequencies within a certain range to pass and attenuates frequencies outside that range. So then when the tone control is adjusted, the range slides up and down. We found this worked well because it highlights the complexity of the sounds we were making by showing and then hiding their different spectral parts. The important consideration for using this kind of filter is finding the appropriate Q factor. The Q factor just, uh, it just determines the width of the frequency band that's left unattenuated. And this is important um, for finding a balance between something that's narrow enough to clearly show the difference when the tone is adjusted, but not so narrow that it destroys the sound's interest and complexity. All right, now that we've talked everything through, I hope you enjoy this performance of Cartridge Music from October 2019 at the University of Toronto.
Thank you. Thank you all. That, that was wonderful. Thank you. Um, I meant to contextualize that. Uh, I, if I remember correctly, you had actually submitted this uh, for 2020. Is that right? As a as a kind of practice work where there was going to be a performance and so on. So yeah, I'm really happy to yeah. see it. Thank thank you for adapting uh, to the current you know situation. Um, yeah, that was wonderful. I think we we could take a few minutes of uh, questions if people have questions about the the details of this piece or, or you know what you heard in the presentation. Then we'll move back to um, to Benny and Mikhail. Any questions? Rama. Uh, I don't know if this is as much of a question as an observation was I was just watching you guys perform that, which was beautiful. Thank you. Um, uh, reminded me a lot of um, the Stockhausen um, microphony. And I was, um, of course, it was the later piece, I guess, but um, uh, I hadn't made that connection before. So that was that was interesting to see. Have you guys performed that piece as well? Uh, we're going to actually, believe it or not. I, I, I've been, uh, I've been uh, researching sort of uh, different reconstructions of that piece for for a few years now, um, and we were we we're actually planning to perform it here in uh, in twenty twenty one, but uh, but yeah no I I actually think the similarities between the two pieces are are quite striking, um, and uh, uh, Microphony One was only four years later actually it was nineteen sixty four and uh, coincident well perhaps not coincidentally it was it was after uh, in, in between these two time periods. Uh, Cage had met Stockhausen at Darmstadt. And so I, I actually think that this work um, was perhaps influential uh, to Stockhausen. I, I think for sure. It certainly seems so, yeah. Um, yeah, I would definitely encourage you guys to um, propose a performance of uh, either one of these pieces at the uh, next tenor. I think that would be really cool. Yeah. I personally am a big fan of the microphony and the whole process of, of the interpretation instructions in that piece, I think are really, really interesting. Yeah, in, in uh, kind of revisiting some of these materials, I found a blog by somebody else, uh, by Jaime Olivers, maybe some of you know this fellow, that also did a performance of Cartridge Music a while back and had assembled a PD patch to do the score part. And he said he showed it to Gordon Muma, who, you know, had worked with Cage for a long time. And Gordon Muma said, wow, geez, that could have saved us a lot of time back in the day. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's quite a process to put them together. Uh, you really have to sit down and uh, figure everything out, and then try to interpret, you know, yeah. what the lines and the dots are going to mean. Yeah. So one of the things that came up for me in reading all of this work was that, like I said, I, these feel like really different projects. The the quartet that we saw um, beginning, you know, in the beginning, is really engaged with the 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 technology and the physicality of of these and the building of these instruments. Um, and then in the second presentation, we have this um, really attempt to kind of model in a geometric fashion the 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 temporal structure of the you know the uh, of the of the work so that you can provide something to the performer. And I think one of the things that comes up, one of the questions that came up for me is just how did these projects get started? Like when was the moment that you realized for both of you um, that oh there's there's some kind of situated research that's in, that's interesting to to do in this context in order to um, perform this in a way that captures the spirit of the piece in some way. So maybe, maybe I'll go back to the quartet if you if you want to take that one first. Sorry for calling you the quartet. It's just too many names. Um, I think for us, well, we were uh, the piece was programmed for the for the university for a concert of Cage's works, um, and we were tasked with preparing it. Um, and for us, it was really seeing the the lack of material about how people have gone about putting this piece together and it's it's non-trivial um figuring out how these things work and like the the phonograph cartridges themselves you need a you need an old kind of phonograph cartridge to make it work like there are new phonograph cartridges that use a, a magnetic coil um and they're just impossible to modify to get them to work so there's just a there was a lot of uh, steps in the process of putting it together. And, and at that point, it seemed like, well, we're doing real work here. We should probably write it down, share it so that whenever someone else wants to play the piece, it'll be a little bit easier. Great. Yeah. And um, I mean, I think, um, yeah, one of the things that came up for me was um, this, this question of, of kind of 
sticking to the letter of the score as best you can or whatever, or, or kind of the notion of a, a, the dubious notion of a kind of authentic performance practice and what that means in the sense of cage where, like you're saying, there, there are questions about how you even have, what, what the instrument even is today in, in this case. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting in John Cage's letters, he actually mentions that some some of his performance were entirely improvised of of cartridge music as well. And like, maybe that's just because everyone was flying in the day of and they didn't have time to sit down with all the transparencies and, and work out a new version. But um, yeah, it's it's a bit of a, a balance, you know, but between feeling like you've really done done the piece justice and taken it seriously and on its own terms and and making something that that you find to be beautiful in the moment of of its creation nice yeah oh i was going to add that it's it's also interesting that you know i mean we we there's there's i mean there's there's so much that the performer has to do in terms of interpretation i mean even though you know you you get this sort of strict protocol like he gives a full page of instructions for how to put together this score um it's almost like a game of telephone in that you have to you have to make each minute separately and then write it down and then and then you have to put all those together and interpret it and so you know you saw in some of the older interpretations they're just sort of scrawled notes on scraps of paper or for us we had a we had an excel spreadsheet um it would have been really nice to have you know a, a very nice graphic score like uh <laughs> for the for the music for pieces but um but yeah i mean it's it's difficult because there there is so much that as performers, we have to interpret, even though from the outset of the piece, it seems like, you know, that you could theoretically give like a very strict interpretation. Right, right. And for Benny and Mikhail, um, I, I think that that seems to resonate in this case too, where the, you talk in the paper about how the, um, you know, the performer's job is to kind of assemble their own part and begin to understand it. But I think that if you run into some of these performance problems that you're anticipating where, you know, you as you're reading, you realize that there are situations where you can get yourself into a kind of panic state. Um, there, there are reasons then to take some steps that would um, uh, minimize the possibility. But then, in that case, you per perhaps lose the lose the possibility of of finding spontaneity in the performance. Um, <clears throat> I would say that. We performed the piece uh, several times with different combinations, and Cage really gives uh, the way to per to prepare the piece for each one alone. And he says that uh, one meeting before the concert would be enough, uh, not to lose uh, spontaneity and uh, to discover coincidences that uh, happens one in a performance. And the fact is that you discover when practicing alone already, that there are some difficulties in the time management and you never know why. You think, okay, I didn't start early enough. I, I will do it next time. But then when we started to, to build uh, the, the timeline presentation, we discovered that there were things that were really very hard, and if you want to do the the um, the yellow material, the, the long notes, if you want to do it uh, several times, you have to start very early, uh, and that's how we came to to this uh, uh, presentation to help the musicians. And some of the features are used uh, according to his. Uh, willing. If, if he doesn't want to use it, he can use uh, his uh, paper parts and use a, 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 a chronometer and stopwatch to, to do a, a, a normal performance. Well, I don't know if you want to, to add something to this. Uh, maybe, uh, yes, uh, I, I'm going to speak a little bit because it's all this project with, with Benny, it's in fact inside something that we call it a performance, a performance assisted by computer. The idea is to help the performer to prepare the piece and also uh, to, to play the piece. And 
the, the main point here, especially in the cage pieces, it's, it's what, uh, it's what Ben said, but have another point also, that is the, the support that where are the, the representation of, um, of cage. Here in the music four is not exactly the, ca the case, but for example, in, in other pieces, like for example, in the concert for piano and, and instruments, uh, we have a big problem that the representation, the musical representations are on musical sheets of paper. What means that if you really would like to, to play uh, exactly how Cage uh, said, because the instructions of, of Cage are very clear, it's very hard because you, you must manage turning page, in the case, for example, the trombone changing mutes. And we have another problem also, we know and uh, we, can, we can speak about that, especially as Westerns, we have a way to look to a sheet of papers. And we know that when you look to a sheet of papers, you have the very well-known uh, golden triangle that is very no, that you know that all your attention goes first on the upper left part. That means that the way that we see a page, it's uh, biased. Uh, I don't know if it's a good uh, term in English, but you, you know, and biased. It's going to give biased. really uh, the same probability to all the page. And being able to, to work with this kind of, of um, interfaces of, this, uh, of environments, we can really try to find a way to, uh, to play the piece with um, a minimum of non-intention and also trying to, to go through this kind of bias of the reading a page. Yeah, um, yeah, and I, I also think the work of both of these projects is immensely valuable, not just for performers, but but to provide insight to people um, like all of us here that you know I've never performed any of these pieces. Uh, so I, I and I, I think that some of the issues that you're bringing up are things that you do discover in performance. Um, so for some of us who are looking to try to better understand the music of Cage. Um, not through performance, uh, these types of insights are really critical. And the, the, the kind of visual modeling of, of the work of um, Malton Sluchin, I think is, is um, immensely valuable, yeah. And uh, yeah, and, and also the insights of, of the quartet. Um, the, uh, I just wanted to bring out, so we're running short on time. So I wanna make sure that any, anybody who uh, has any thoughts or questions has a chance to make them before we close. Um, I was also struck by, um, I don't know who was there, but there was a really nice session earlier today where we had a couple of questions about um, kind of challenging the notion of the, of the relationship to the score, of the score to the work, whatever this is. Um, and also about the questions of kind of the embodied knowledge of performers and how performers accumulate this knowledge and, and um, what if anything is transmissible and so on. So I just wanted to throw out to the, to the group of people who may have been in those sessions uh, that there are, I think, some nice uh, conceptual links to try to make between um, the work going on here and the, the theoretical work that was presented in those, in, in those sessions, in that session. Um, so we have about three minutes left. Any, uh, any other questions from anybody else or anything that any of you presenters would like to add before we close? All right, well, I think maybe that's the moment then. Um, I just wanna thank all of you again. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. This was, um, this was for me a really nice event and uh, really nice. I haven't uh, looked at the work of Cage in a few years now. And so for me, it was really nice to get back into this and um, revisit and do some listening and watch some videos and so on. So I thank all of you for that. Um, okay, any final thoughts? Great, then I think the next uh, event, we have a little break now, is that right? Yes, uh, right, the next event, so we got a short break and then the next event is at uh, 6 p.m. Uh, for the, the next keynote. So, okay, thank you all. <laughs>